Okay, so in this video I'm going to go through building Bus Raider version 2.2. This is the first time I've built this version of the board and so there may be one or two issues um, but we'll just try and keep moving and um, go through the whole process. So I think to start off with I always like to put in place the uh, components that are closest to the board. Um, so in this case I think um, there are not many discrete components. There's a few of these uh, small capacitors, but actually uh, we can probably put those in later. Um, they're fairly easy to bend the pins on the back to hold them in place. So I think, um, looking at it, I think I'll probably just start with the IC sockets. Um, those are fairly close to the board, um, and then we'll just try and fit things around them. Um, so... Uh, I'll put the larger ones in place. So these are the 20 pin uh, sockets for, I think all of them are for 74LVC245. So those are the level converters, bidirectional level converters and tri state drivers that are used to drive all the buses. Um, or to read them anyway, they read the address bus and they read the read and write the data bus and read and write the control bus. So um, then I'm going to put in place some uh, 16 pin. So these two down here are the drivers for the address bus. So we have a a counter and uh, a shift register which are used to drive the lower and upper parts of the address bus respectively. Um, I think there's a little bit of write-up um, in the blog about why I've done it that way but it just worked out to be a fairly convenient way. There's a 74 HCT138 socket going in that's a multi demultiplexer, and then um, or a decoder, I guess. And then this one here is um, <clears throat> now there are two 7474 chips on the board: an HCT version up here and an HC version down here. Um, there's a little bit of a challenge in a kind of data race. Um, and I found that the, that selection of chips works well. I think they'll probably both work as HCTs. Uh, I'm trying to use a, the wrong size socket for that. Um, let me just find the right size. Um, but it's I've, I've tested it out a few times and it seems to work pretty well with that combination of chips. I have also added in another delay in a signal line in this version to try and avoid that data race condition which just occurred on a few of the boards that had been built so okay so that's just a few of the kind of glue logic chips got there as well so that's all the IC sockets um, now what I like to do is to use some other PCB um, just to hold the chips in place while I turn them over. Um, there have been a few suggestions about different things that I could do, like using tape or whatever, but um, I, I don't know, just any, any way that works, I guess. So just going to start now with a bit of soldering. So I'm just going to work down all of these. I think I'll just slide this out. There we go. And I might just try and turn it around a little bit to make it easier for me. Soldering iron tip seems okay. I'm using a I'm using a solder that um, uh, I'm not particularly happy with. Um, I think all my career I've used lead, uh, leaded solder and now it's quite hard to get hold of leaded solder. Um, 
so I've started using lead free and I'm experimenting with various different kinds but none of them seem to be quite uh, as good as I would hope. I'm just assuming that the sockets are going to be, because the board's completely flat, I'm assuming the sockets are going to be lying uh, flat. If you're slightly worried about it you could just tack one end, uh, one pin on a socket and then you could push the socket in place with your hand while you're um, just touching the soldering iron to that pin. Yeah, this is the sort of issue I get with a solder. It doesn't seem to always flow the way I'd like. Uh, I guess it may be an issue with this the boards that I've been receiving recently. These are from um, JLC PCB, which is sort of part of the Easy EDA group, um, and they're pretty pretty excellent boards they produce. This is a four layer board. Um, and they produce them quickly and they always seem to be of good quality um, but I'm not sure I'm, it doesn't seem a big problem but um, just on some of the soldered joints I'm finding that um, the solder doesn't really seem to flow as well as I kind of expect it to and I'm wondering if that is the solder itself or if it's the particular batch of boards or what it might be I'm not sure so I'm just kind of doing a mix of tacking the ends and you know, see again I can't get that to, to flow there properly. It seems to have done it eventually. But... Right, so I'm just doing a mix of tacking the ends and uh, now I'll start working down um, properly down these. Um, I think I'm just going to put a fan on and probably speed the video up at this point to avoid the tedium of watching me solder a lot of joints. So I quite like to use a fan when I'm soldering just to ensure that I don't breathe too many of these nasty fumes. Okay, so it seems I've missed one of the IC sockets. I'm not sure how I did that, but uh, either it dropped out or whatever, but there we are, I've got that one back in now. Okay, so <clears throat> now we have all the IC sockets in place. They all have their um, pin one down on the bottom left-hand corner, so it should be reasonably easy to get them in the right orientation. I'm going to do the long edge connector now, uh, which is this one here. So this is a um, the edge connector that's used on the RC2014 bus. And that pin is a little bent. So I need to bend that back into place. I tend to find these are quite often a little bit deformed, unfortunately, when they get delivered. So... Um, just a bit of tweaking needed. There we go. Right, and then so that goes in here along the this long edge. It should should go in and hold itself in place if you push it fairly hard. It should hold itself in place while you solder it. So I'm going to turn the fan on again and go for another soldering stint. Okay, so that's the long edge connector done. Uh, you may notice that I've bridged here 
um, I, le I left it to this point so that I could just discuss with you um, some of the ways of removing bridges like that. So one thing you could do is just, just go with a very clean soldering iron tip and just try and remove the solder from pins that are this distance apart, like 0.1 of an inch apart. It's normally fairly easy to do that um, and you just have to make sure that the soldering iron tips fairly clean. Um, you could also use a solder sucker like this sort of thing. This is a particularly good one I found uh, from a brand called Engineer. Um, so obviously you, you push down the end and then you just uh, put it onto the joint, melt the joint and uh, press the button and you get a nice clean um, joint. It doesn't always work as well as that but um, Generally works fairly well and another alternative is you could use the age-old technique of tapping it on the table while the solder is moist, which I still use sometimes, and there's also solder wick, um, which you can get this kind of thing, and um, then you just basically clip, chop the end off, um, so you've got a nice new bit, and then put it onto the joint and put the soldering iron on it onto it and uh, it should sort of suck up kind of wick up the solder from the joint uh, so anyway that was that's that one sorted out so if we now take a look at where we are um, we've got a long edge connector here to put in place and these two for the so these are the ones for the modules that sit on top of the board so there's a Raspberry Pi um, and there's an ESP32 to be put on top of the board. And then um, we've also got a few discrete components. Um, so we've got some FETs down here and we've got a bunch of um, header, uh, header strip uh, here and we've got the capacitors and some switches. So I think pretty much everything, it doesn't really matter what order you do things in at this point, I think it's, um, um, these are fairly high off the board, so maybe it would be better to wait a little bit before putting these on. Um, so I might just take them off again, and um, maybe we'll put some of the slightly lower components in place, like some of these resistor networks. So this, this one um, has eight pins, and... Um, this one's going to go in here, so it, uh, we're R2-22K. Um, now it doesn't matter which way around this one goes. The other ones, the two that go here, that they do matter, but this one doesn't matter. But I mean, you might as well put it in this way around, I guess. Um, the reason it doesn't matter is that he, there are four individual resistors inside here, so they just go from pin 1 to pin 2 and then from pin 3 to pin 4 and so on and so it doesn't actually matter if you reverse it completely so we'll put that in <clears throat> and then we'll put in the two longer the two other ones so this is the long one 13 pins and that one goes in here and it does matter which way around so you can see pin 1's marked with a square um and pin 1 on the on the module is marked with a, a dot so those need to be that way around and this one also matters so this is an, a five pin and this one has to go in again with the dot matching the square on the board so again I'll use my bit of PCB to um, to turn it over and to hold it in place and then we'll solder those so I think with these I will I'm just going to tack one end to start off with, so one pin. I can feel them moving around as I as I try and solder them. So I'm just going to tack one, one pin like this. Doesn't matter which pin you choose. And then I'm going to wait until it's settled. And now I'm going to just put my finger on the component at the back while I'm holding the board like this. And I'm just going to melt that position and just ease it back into place. So I could just feel it move slightly as I did that. Um, just getting it a bit close to the board. That one's not moved at all. And they're fairly vertical. 
it was nice to make the boards nice and neat. So that's that one. And this one, or well, we could just bend it as I did there and leave the pin, or you could just actually melt the pin and move it at the same time. But, yeah, there we go, that's kind of nice and vertical now. And um, so now we'll do the rest of those pins. I'm, uh, I've not put the fan on this time, but I can see this stream of smoke sort of swirling around away from me at the moment, so just doing a bit of blowing to try and keep it away. Not particularly nice stuff to inhale. Right. Okay, there we go. So I think that's all of those. Right, what's next? So let's put some of these decoupling capacitors in now. So um, we have a 10 microfarad. So that's one of these. So can't exactly see what it says on there, but um, I think I know these are 10 microfarad ones. Um, so that's that one there, and there's another one here. So these are ceramic 10 microfarad capacitors, which are used for the main 5 volt and 3.3 volt supplies. And then there are a couple of other decoupling capacitors around the board. Probably should be more actually, um, but that's what I've designed it with. You can always add some more if you feel like it by tacking them to the bottom of the board or something. That's, well, I tend to do that quite a bit. If you feel that there are in, there's inadequate decoupling, which is um, can be a bit of a problem in in uh, digital circuits like this. There's one more. Oh, that's a 10 microfarad as well. So okay. Okay, so that's that's all the capacitors that I can see anyway. Um, yeah, I think that's that all of them. Right, so we'll just solder those in place. Yeah, I would always be using a fan normally, but um, when I'm recording a video like this, it sometimes makes the audio a bit difficult to hear. So I've decided that I'll just use it for the big sections where I'm doing a lot of joints, and then I'll just try and blow away the smoke the rest of the time. But I definitely recommend using a fan. Okay, so for the first time we've actually got some leads to chop off, so we'll just chop these not ridiculously close to the board. Sometimes you find that you can actually chop off the the joint itself if you use cutters like this, side cutters that can cut very close to the board, you actually end up affecting the joint, so just want to keep it half a millimetre or so above above the PCB surface, so I tend to just tilt, rather than using them completely flat, I just sort of tilt them slightly to make sure that I cut, um, I don't cut absolutely right at the, uh, at the surface of the board. Okay, so that's that. And I think we'll put some of these <coughs> FETs in place now. Uh, so we, there are six of these. Um, in this version, I've uh, designed it to use these uh, lead formed um, FETs, so I think they'll probably be supplied like this, so you need to chop them off 
they're BS170s. So, let's Bunch of these. So you need to be a bit careful with these because there is another place on the board where a similar um, shape uh, device goes, which is here. So this is actually a regulator, and these one, two, three, four, five, six, these are FETs. So you don't want to mistake one for the other. So these are the FETs, BS170 and they go in the places um, that I've indicated and they go in just with the D shape in the way that uh, it's shown on the PCB mask and the screen, the silk screen rather so there we go, that's all of those now you could bend the leads on the bottom uh, to hold them in place but I think I'm just going to go with this approach again um, Hopefully that will do a reasonable job. Give it a bit of a wiggle. If I can get them to sit flat. And then... Um, I don't think it's coming off the board, so maybe I'll just remove it. Okay, get that out of the way. Right, so let's try and get this to sit reasonably flat. I think I'm just going to do one of the pins on each one again um, and then I'll just make sure that they're nice and neat on the other side. The board is sitting at a slight angle so they're probably not going to be, yeah they're slightly angled so I'll just obviously this doesn't actually affect the the aesthetics don't really affect the electronics, but um, I just quite like it to look nice and neat. There we go, those look alright. One, that one seems to be sitting fairly square. Have another good little go at that one. There we go. I think I've moved it too far now. Right, I think I'm happy with those now. Okay. Spin it round to get these ones. Okay, that's that done. A bit more snipping. Okay. Right, so what else have we got to put on there? Well, we've got that regulator that we mentioned. Um, we've got the two switches, we've got some headers, and we've got the um, the sockets for the, the modules. So um, I, think, uh, I'll put in, I think I'll put these headers in now. So that, and then there's this <clears throat> extra one here which is for the reset on a Raspberry Pi Zero. Um, it turns out only the Raspberry Pi Zero has this extra little bit here um, of the ones that I've looked at anyway. Certainly the Raspberry Pi 3 doesn't have have that. Um, so this is quite useful because it allows you to put a reset switch onto the board which allows you to reset the Raspberry Pi if you need to. So we'll go ahead with this approach again. Turn it over. There we 
right. And then I'm just going to tack the ends and then I'm going to put the fan on, I think, because there's quite a lot to do here. So I'll just so I've tacked all the ends. I'm just going to make sure that they're lying flat. That seems pretty good. Just hold them, I'm just holding them in place while I'm tacking them. I'm not sure if I'm capturing all of this on the video, but it's quite hard to look at both sides of the board at the same time. So that one's just lying, sticking slightly out. So I'm going to hold it and mount that just to make sure that it's near enough. They don't have to be perfect these because um, the pins, there's a sort of taper on the on the entry to the socket so the pin will find its way. So that's that. And I'm going to do a bit more soldering now. So you may have seen there that I was struggling with this pin here. Um, I'm not quite sure why. I think there is maybe something, um, a little bit of a coating on the board. That um, So what I'm finding is that if I leave the soldering on a little bit longer than I normally would, it tends to make the joint rather better. Um, so that's possibly because something is having to be kind of burnt off the the board. It might be worth trying to clean the board with some isopropyl alcohol or something before starting the construction. Um, not sure I've had this, well not, not had this particular problem before, um, but um, I have noticed actually with just the last board that I built from which was a similar, uh, the, just the 2.1 board which I didn't actually release, uh, there were some errors on it. And that board also had a similar kind of thing. Um, it came from the same manufacturer a few weeks before, so um, it may be that there is something that uh, is just a little bit of a um, maybe in it, some extra coating that hasn't been quite washed off the board properly. So, as I say, getting some isopropyl alcohol and maybe just um, giving the board a quick clean with a with a cloth um, and some alcohol might be a good idea. I'm not sure if that'll work but it might be worth trying if you if you especially if you try a few joints and find there's a problem then maybe you could try and try that on another area of the board and just see if it if it helps. So we're pretty much there now um, We've got these switches to put in place, so this one and this one. Um, so they normally hold themselves fairly well while you while you solder. So they've got little tags on them. So let's see, it's actually the solder's working quite well for these. It only just seems to affect certain parts of the board, but. I don't know, maybe I'm imagining it. Right, so that's those. So this is the demo button. Um, and also, um, so that can be used for uh, clicking through demo uh, kind of programs that you can set up. And this is just the reset button, not generally very needed on the Raspberry Pi and then um, we've got the regulator to put in place and a few headers here, there are far fewer headers now on this board than there used to be um, but we just need two pins so I'll break off I'll do it with a pair of pliers so just break off two pins like that two more Oops, slightly magnetized pliers and um, so we'll put those in place. So then there's the regulator. And there's... Now what I sometimes find is if you have a, another bit of header strip, um, it can be quite useful to just 
put over these. It's as though they're I'm going to say they are a multiple of 0.1 of an inch apart, but I think maybe they're not quite, but anyway, it's fairly close. So this seems to work, at least to start off with, to hold them in place, and then we can again tack one pin on each and just check that they're fairly vertical. Not too bad, but that one's a little bit wobbly, so we should have chosen the other pin. Yeah, okay, they're full now. So, so these are just um, headers for um, the paging line, which is used for injection of instructions for debug, single step debugging. And this is the clock, so the board can generate a clock for the Z Z80, which makes it possible to emulate different kinds of computers that are closer to their actual speed and also to bump the speed up um, to try things out and then this is the NMI uh, jumper here just in case you do want to use or don't want to use NMI um, so let's just find that regulator Okay, so this is the regulator. And uh, that just goes in there. So we are going to have to bend the pins now because we've put a few things in that are bigger than this. Might have been better to put that in earlier. Okay. Okay, so these are extra holes um, just for um, maybe making modifications if you have any ideas of things you want to try and add to the board, uh, as are these, these down here, so you don't put anything into those um, at this stage. Um, and this is a, uh, sorry, these three are, are ex extras as well. But as you can see from the back of the board, these, this um, rectangle here, this square of nine here, and these are actually used. So these are for expansion, so they just bring out some of the ESP32 lines, the ones that you can see here, so GPIO 22, 13, 25, 15, and so on, onto these pins here. And then this is for the SD card which you can add on. So in previous versions, um, I've just had an option of using a surface mount SD card. This and the the, um, uh, the PCB layout is still there for, for doing it that way. But actually I've now found a, um, a source of a little extra uh, board from um, company called Protopic, a Scottish company, and um, so I'm going to be supplying these, and so this fits on here as a sort of extra kind of board and makes it a bit easier, so there's no um, soldering of the surface mount uh, which was required on the previous version. So the way I'm thinking about doing this, I haven't actually tried this yet, um, is to, I, I mean you could either put little bits of wire through, I think it's not a good idea to have this kind of a long way away from the board, um, it seems logical to me to have it kind of sandwiched right to, next to the board, so you could either put little bits of wire through like some of the legs of the resistors that you might have, or the capacitors rather, that you might have chopped off, so like this, you could just do that individually. Um, with each pin, or what I've been thinking is you could just use a piece of strip like this, so I think we'll go with this approach for now, and 
um, it'll just hold it in place while you solder it and then you could just chop it off um, if you wanted to to neaten it up so I'm just going to break that off I think I broke that in the wrong place no. No. so what I'm thinking is that we'll go through from this side so we'll have this little thing sticking out it shouldn't be a problem and then we'll just solder it on well, actually that won't work will it because I won't be able to get to these to solder them properly I could do these joints first and then put this on and then do these um, but then that would be it'd probably be a little bit this would sit slightly above the board because there'll be a little bit of solder still on on here so so another alternative I suppose would be to to put this slightly up like that so um, so you could actually solder both sides and then chop the top off maybe or just or, or leave it in place either way um, I'm trying to think of a better solution I can't think of one at the moment so I think I might go with this see if I can get this to work put it like this maybe try and just happens to be about the right height to solder so it's holding itself in place okay so I'm just going to put this these pliers on here to hold hold it a little bit so it doesn't fall out and then I'm going to do one pin like this from this side mm. it's not going to be easy to solder into there and I have to push that down a bit well um, I mean another alternative I suppose would be to push it up a bit again and then maybe just chop them off before before I solder the other side so I could just go along here and chop it off um, maybe that's a better idea yeah maybe that's what I'll do so I think I'll Try and just get that to a consistent height so they're sticking up the same kind of amount on this side but not too much so it gets in the way of something another board maybe that's put next to it and then we'll solder these and then what I'm thinking is that we'll just and lift this up with a, a little bit and maybe chop these off it's a little bit fiddlier than I would hope I'd hoped okay so that came off fairly easily in the end that hurt <laughs> probably not a good idea to put your finger right over that ouch it still hurts if you put it a little bit further away okay so that's those on the other side and now i can it may be better just to use the um, short sections of wire for this and uh, this approach using trying to use a header strip isn't ideal although I, I think one thing that it will be good about it is that it'll these are quite um, physically strong so the SD um, module is going to be reasonably well attached to the um, to the board it's not going to move you can see it's 
it's not moving very much if I if I do that. So it's um, it's fairly well stuck on there. Um, so so yeah, I think I'm reasonably happy with that. Probably have to probably have to try and find a little bit of your own technique for um, for doing those. But um, at least that's one way, and that will probably work. And we've managed to get it soldered well on both sides, um, so we know that the connections are going to be good. Um, so that's that completes the, the construction to this point. We've now got to put the chips in place, um, but we could do that after an initial test if you wanted to do an initial um, test to just check that the, the voltages uh, are where you'd expect them to be. Um, so um, the LVC245 chips, for instance, they have 3 volt 3, uh, should be appearing on pin 20 of those chips so that's one of the things you could test at this stage if you plug the board into the RC2014 bus you should be seeing 3.3 volts compared to ground um, on this pin pin 20 of any of the uh, the longer sockets here um, and then um, you could also, I mean, it's difficult to believe that 5 volts wouldn't be in place unless there was a short, but um, the the chips which are HC uh, or HCT chips, they should have um, 5 volts at their, um, in this case, pin 14 of this chip should be, should be 5 volts because the, the HCT chips um, are 5 volt chips. Um, and I think that's about it really you could you could populate this here this is a ground test point um, you could just use one uh, you could break off one of these header strip uh, pins and then put that into there that's often quite useful for testing I might as well just do that now um, it's good to know where you've got a, a ground point to use when you're testing a board Sometimes I actually put this on the other side if I'm not too worried about the boards, putting boards next to it, just so it's easy, even easier to get to. But it's fairly easy to get to here um, if you're just using a header pin. So um, I'll just, uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to hold that in place while I turn the board over. And that's just about worked. Again, I'm finding it difficult to get in that joint. Okay, and often these are not very vertical when you've put them in if it's just one pin. So sometimes I do this, I use my nail. I don't know if you can actually see that, but I'm trying to avoid burning myself basically. Um, just holding it into place. Um, so that's not too bad. Okay, um, so yeah, so if you if you do some testing at this stage, um, then that's probably not a bad idea. Just check that the, the voltage regulator is working and putting 3.3 volts in the right place. And then you could start populating the chips. So when it comes to the chips, um, you need to make sure that um, they fit into the sockets okay. I find that just kind of holding them and rolling them slightly like that makes them... Um, fit the shape better. So this one's the HCT74. So I'll put that one in there. And then we've got a number of these LVC245s. So again I'll just hold it like this and kind of roll it forward slightly. Um, which just bends all the pins evenly to be a bit straighter. They're obviously designed for put it being put in place by a machine. Um, which would squeeze the pins together while it was going in. But it's not easy to do that with your hands. So I find this rolling technique just, you don't want to go too far with it because it will make the the chip not sit in the socket very well if you go too far. But if you just, you just take a little bit of the, of the, um, the bend off it and then it just means it's enough that, I've got enough there, it's enough that when you put it into the socket, um, it just fits in uh, a bit more directly. So 
So you still, I still find that you have to kind of put it in from the side and then push to to get that um, to get it into the socket. So a bit of a roll, and then put it in and a bit of gentle pushing. Okay, so that one goes in there, just checking. So it's also a good idea to do a visual inspection of the board. I haven't really talked about that yet, but just go over all of the joints, just having a look, make sure there's no bridges or little bits of extra material lying around, extra solder or whatever. Um, these will look okay. Um, but it's a really good idea just to do a visual inspection. Okay, so I'll press on with the chips. So another one. <clears throat> so this is the HCT02. So this goes at the top left. Right there. And then we've got, um, so this is an HTC 08. And goes in here. So obviously you need to make sure that you put all the chips in the right places and the right way round. So as I say, the little notch should always be to the left when the board's in this orientation. So all the chips should have the notch to the left. So this is the ALS 1035. So that one's going to go in there. Sometimes with these smaller chips, you only need to roll one side of it because um, you're sort of pushing against the other side as you push it in the socket. And then this is a 595, so this is the one on the bottom left. That one. That's a five nine zero. And this is the 138. Sometimes they don't seem to quite sit right and then just have to try and push them into place a bit more actively. Um, difficult to, to know how hard to press sometimes. So I think I've only got the HTC T74s to hand, so I'll just find one of these. So that's an HC74. Okay. So now we're at the stage where we could um, now we're at the stage where we could put in the the modules. So the Raspberry Pi and the ESP32. 
Uh, I think at this stage it definitely would be a good idea to check the the voltages. Always good to make sure you don't blow up these more sensitive chips. Um, so um, just checking that you've got five volts um, in the right place. If you look in the wiki, there's a little bit of information about how you could do some testing at this stage. Uh, but I'm just going to press on for the purposes of the video and um, to show you how to put together the ESP32 part. So this is the way the ESP32 comes. We don't actually need any of these bits. Um, so I put those to one side, maybe use them in some other project. And then the ESP32 is going to go onto here and we're going to use mail connectors for this. So um, so we're just going to break off 10, um, these are, there are 10 pins along each side of this uh, unit. So we're just going to break them off uh, like this. Now sometimes when you do this, this happens, the pins stick out. So you need to push that back in somehow, perhaps with a pair of pliers, to make sure that it's at the right, uh, I pushed it in too far, so I'm just going to try and pull it back out again a bit. Fiddly. Okay, that's about right now. Um, I'm doing this so that I can just. I'm, I'm just really using it as a holder for the, um, the the pins while I solder them. That's why I'm actually pushing them in, into this uh, header like this. Um, there may be a better way of doing this that I haven't thought of, but um, I'll just try wiggling it in. Sometimes that works a bit better and they don't tend to push out quite so much if you kind of just wiggle sideways. Now it seems to have gone in a bit more easily this time and hasn't the pen hasn't popped out, so maybe that's a better technique. So now if we put that in place, making sure that we're catching all of the all the pins that we're supposed to be catching, and then we can go ahead and solder this module. It does seem noticeable that this takes the solder more readily than than my um, than the PCB did, which is kind of interesting. So maybe there is some sort of there is just a little bit of something on the PCB. Actually, to be fair, I think these are gold-plated as well, so maybe that's the difference. Whereas the PCBs are just tinned. Okay, so that's, that's that module in place. And now, for the Raspberry Pi... I think I actually only have pre-soldered ones, um, but um, you'll obviously need to obtain your own ones of these because they're only available in one-offs. Um, you can either use this, which is a Pi Zero W, or a you can just use a Pi Zero, and um, both work. Um, and I've soldered in this extra header here. You can see uh, which is the one that I mentioned for the reset button. You don't need the one that's marked TV to be, uh, nothing needs to be inserted in, in that position. Um, so once you've 
and you can use the same technique that I used on the ESP32 to hold the pins in place while you're soldering it if you've got um, one that requires separate soldering and then I uh, just simply ease that into place here uh, I find with a lot of cases that actually wiggling backwards and forwards rather than pressing is, uh, is a good technique it also seems to work well for taking the board out of the bus if you wiggle it backwards and forwards like this it comes out really easily uh, certainly the ones with two rows of pins do whereas if you try and pull it out sideways like this it tends to bend the pins so that's I found that to be quite a good technique and then there's just for a bit of uh, stability um, there's one uh, pillar provided it's not necessary to put anything in these two places um, in fact I only really put the holes in place for these because I was experimenting with a bigger board like a full Raspberry Pi board or a Raspberry Pi A um, but um, it's not needed for this purpose so you can put this in either way around it might look slightly neater to put it in this way around I guess uh, with the bolt head on the outside of the Raspberry Pi and a bit of a fiddle to get in place but once that's in it's normally quite straightforward and then you can just um, put the nut on the back Oops. which I failed to do right and then just tighten that up probably need to do, do it with a, a screwdriver a little bit of tighter than that but finger tight is probably okay for me and then uh, now you have the connectors here the HDMI um, and you generally um, won't use the uh, the other connectors on the Raspberry Pi and then you can use this connector here on the ESP32 I'm oh, sorry you will use the <laughs> you will use this connector for a keyboard so this is the one which isn't marked power if you can really see that anymore but this one over here is marked power in so it's this one that you want to use for the keyboard uh, this is for the HDMI and um, and then you can use this for diagnostic messaging if you open a terminal emulator program like TerraTerm for instance on Windows or Screen on Linux um, you can use this um, to get diagnostic messages out um, but basically that uh, completes the build um, we can just put the headers in place that are needed for the different modes so I normally just run it with all of these three headers in place um, so that's NMI the clock and uh, the paging line okay so that um, that completes the build